Dawn Butler, hello. Hey. How's it going? <laughs> going okay, yeah. Good. I think I've slept for a few hours now, so it's all right. That's nice for you, yeah. happy for you. Yeah. Um, you're standing to be Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, and the Labour Party obviously in a bit of a, a moment of soul searching perhaps after the general election that's just gone by. I wonder what it is that you think the party did wrong over the course of that election campaign. I think there's lots of things that happened and you know there's lots of areas that has to sort of take their fair share of responsibility to why we are not in government when we should be. Um, obviously Brexit did play a part, it was the Brexit election even though we tried to divert away from that as much as we can but that diversion just wasn't good enough, it was just tons and tons and tons of stuff that just got people dizzy. I call it the Toby Carvery of the manifesto, do you know what I mean? There was just so much stuff on the plate that people were just like, no, oh, this is way too much stuff. And as they're going through it, and they're like coming up and I'm bringing them some gravy and some Brussels sprouts, like, hang on. So it was just too much. So we could have had a simple diversion with a simple message so that it landed on people, so people understood what we actually uh, stood for and were campaigning for, but it was just too busy. So there's a number of things. And did we get a fair crack of the whip when it came to the media? Hell no. So, uh, so they have to take responsibility as well. But we have to take responsibility in that, in terms of saying, if the media are not going to give us a fair crack of the whip, if they're not going to sell our policies the way we want it to be sold, then we need to create our own narrative by using different media platforms. That's interesting. I was I'll pick up something you said there, that it's sort of the media's job perhaps to report things in the way that you want them to be reported. I mean, is that their job? Is it not the media's job to be objective and uh, you know, to interpret things through their own lens rather than through the Labour Party's lens? Well, no, I think investigative journalism uh, has a certain standard, which I think many of the journalists fail to reach. Um, if they could just be objective, that would be a great start. Um, but instead there was bias injected in a lot of what they did. And for me, that's wrong. I mean, during the general election, there has to be some uh, resemblance of balance. And so it's good when we get to have our own platform to sell our policies, if you like. Uh, but in the main, I think there was years and years and years and years of, you know, undermining. But we have to be better and we have to be tougher. You know, we've got to fight back. That's something that some other candidates in the leadership race have picked up on is essentially that perhaps Jeremy Corbyn was not as keen to fight back and perhaps be a little bit mean in the way that the media sort of played out the election campaign. Is that something you'd agree with? Do you think he could have been a bit yeah, Jeremy, nastier? Jeremy's not exactly a fighter, is he? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm like, Jeremy, fight back. You know, please fight back. So, but that's not his style. That's not who he is. Um, and because of that, I think uh, people took advantage of that. Um, and, but what we also need to ensure is that we are more than one person and one individual. The Labour Party is made up of lots of amazing people and we have to do better at getting the Labour voice out there in the media. So we need to use all different uh, people at our disposal, all different activists, uh, all different um, experts. We need to use them at our disposal and we need to do more of that and we need to be better at that. And that's what I would do as a deputy leader. I would ensure that we bring in um, everybody that we have. I mean, we have 550,000 members. You know, we've got some brilliant people out there, but who are they? We don't know. So I plan to do a database of all our people and start using people with their skills and experience and making sure that we get that message out there and over the airways and in different media platforms, different social media platforms, different podcasts, all of that kind of thing we need to use and utilise. So do you think there, there is an element of culpability for the leader's office and for the result that came about in the general election? We, we could have done better, evidently, otherwise we would be in government. I mean, our policies, I knocked on thousands and thousands of doors. I travelled around the country. I went to over 41 seats. And when I was knocking on doors, nobody said, oh, look, I really hate your policies. I don't like Labour's policies. They might have questioned... Um, how are we going to pay for them all? And I don't think we were clear enough to say this wasn't a one-term uh, manifesto. This manifesto would take us through and see us through a couple of terms. So we could have been better at even delivering that message. So nobody said they didn't like our policies, though. Our policies were exciting. They were fair. Uh, they talked about making 
the country better and making the country work for everybody. And that's, I mean, who wouldn't want that? And, you know, yes, it's socialism, but it's just good things. Who doesn't want good things? We've spoken a bit about the media there. And Dawn, I wonder why it is recently, last few days, journalists have been mistaking you and a series of other MPs, actually, for each other. And you clearly don't look like each other. And I'm wondering what it is, why you think that is. So it's interesting, Ali, because you can see that, but we don't look <laughs> alike. And for that, I'm grateful. <laughs> but, uh, but others, you know, I think genuinely, others probably can't see that. And so the question has to be, if you've got people in the room that can't identify uh, black people individually, then you need to get somebody in the room who can. Uh, because there is a bias there and, you know, they would need to work on it. But in the meantime, whilst they're working on that bias, let's get people in the room who can identify different black people. Um, and, it, you know, it happens often. But I do think, like, I have a responsibility. So when I first came into Parliament in 2005, uh, people couldn't identify me differently from Diane Abbott. And there, there was only two black women. Uh, parliamentarians. Now the thing is we're all completely different. Um, my hair was always completely different from Diane. So the only, the only thing about us was that we were black women. So you fast forward, you know, a decade later, you know, I've been a minister uh, <laughs> in government, the only black female to be a minister in the House of Commons. And now, uh, you know, I'm getting confused with everybody else and all these new MPs who are coming in. And I think, in a way, I feel like a deep sense of responsibility to change this now because, you know, there's black women coming into parliament on their own rights. You know, they've worked hard to get there. They deserve to be recognised by their name, <laughs> not by me, by their own name. And I just think it's a shame that, you know, our media just haven't caught up. And then, you know, the Evening Standard have apologised. But, you know, to to report a story of mistaken identity and mistaken <laughs> person with somebody else is almost comical um, if it wasn't so tragic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry, it's, it's, not, it's not a funny case, but it's just the, the compounding of an error. It's, the, it's laden with irony. It's but we have to laugh. So the thing is, like, sometimes we laugh. So Marsha and, I, Marsha and I, it's happened a number of times. And sometimes we do laugh about it because we don't take on all of the battles. You know, we have to choose our battles. Because if we took on every single battle, we wouldn't be able to get through to the next day because it's absolutely exhausting. It's exhausting being a black woman having to um, justify my presence in a space every time I'm in a space. You know, it's really quite tiring and exhausting. And so, you know, in putting myself up to be deputy leader is a huge thing to do. I recognise that. Um, and, you know, when people kind of undermine my achievements, when they try and undermine who I am, it's another battle that I have to go through. But part of the reasons why I'm standing is to say, well, actually, as a Labour Party, we should be better than that and we should be leading the way. You know, and as John McDonnell said, you know, what greater, you know, symbol that would say to the country and the world if we had a black female as our deputy leader? What would that say about the Labour Party? And that's part of the reason why I'm doing it. There's also the element in relation to this of the hundreds of middle-aged white blokes who don't really Like ever literally hundreds. There's, there's, like, there's only 50 or so people of colour in Parliament. There's 650 MPs. So there are literally hundreds, 500 white male MPs, lots of them very middle-aged. Uh, and yet still, how often do they get confused? or misidentified and it goes into other other things like quite deeper than that too so it goes into society as a whole how easy is it to label somebody a criminal if they are black label somebody a shoplifter if they are black you know how easy is it to see a white man as the solution to being a leader or being a deputy leader, because that's what you always see, that's what you think is the norm. And, you know, it's that undermining, that constant undermining that we have to fight back against and kick back against. That structural racism. Yeah. And I think perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, it initially happened when you first came into the House of Commons. Did, did someone mistake you for a cleaner initially when you were an MP? 
Absolutely. I got into the members lift and uh, somebody, you know, in a very like disapproving voice, and they were like, this lift really isn't for cleaners. And it took a moment for that to kind of land with me and I wanted to go, what the fuck is this about? So first of all, I had to give the sort of lecture in 30 seconds to how disrespectful that is to cleaners. You know, you, you do not, you would not and should not address cleaners in that way, no matter who they are. And then the fact that I am more than qualified to be in this lift. And so you have to question yourself to why you think that I am not qualified to be in this lift. And in fact, I'm overqualified. I'm more qualified than you to be in this lift. I am, you know, a minister in Her Majesty's government. You know, I have more than earned my rightful place in this goddamn lift. You know, you get the fuck out of it. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so what, what do you think this speaks to more broadly in British, not just political media, but media more generally, particularly in light of recent weeks and what we've seen with, with Meghan Markle and the way that she's been treated by the British media establishment? So at the moment, we're living in this kind of Alice in Wonderland world where if you speak about racism, it's a really bad thing. But if you're racist, it's kind of okay. And you're just like, really? So we're not allowed to speak about racism, but you're okay to be racist. It's like, is that re when did that become okay? When did it become okay to excuse racism? When did it become okay to excuse the stuff that our current Prime Minister in number 10 is saying? When did that become okay? It's not okay. And so we have to kind of stand up against that. But also the other thing is, we need allies, you know, like it's really great that at the moment we've got people sort of using their privilege in a way that highlights injustices uh, around the world in different environments. And we need to kind of get to that stage. I do lots of work for the LGBTQI plus community and using my platform to, to elevate others, you know, and that's what we need to do. That's how we make a better society making society fairer. It's just about fairness. It's not about, oh, we want to treat you differently or we want you to be you know, better than that. It's just about fairness. Let's introduce fairness. We've got so many mediocre white men in parliament, right? They don't get excused, they don't get, ex you know, they don't get explained away or excused. It, get, you know, it gets promoted, you know? And I, I always say like, we, we know when we've reached true equality, when we have as many shit women in parliament as we have shit men then we know that we've reached true equality. Not that I want to get shit people in Parliament, but you get, you I get what I'm I saying. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, back to the, to the deputy leadership race. Uh -huh. I think a lot of people have described this as the coronation of Angela Rayner, that essentially this, this contest is sewn up before it's even started, before the ballots, before we know who's on the ballot, she's won it. I mean, presumably you wouldn't accept that, but I mean, make the case for me because it seems like she's going to run away with it. Like, what, what makes you think that you can win? I would never accept that case. If I ever accepted that, then I wouldn't be here today as an MP. So when I first stood to be an MP, um, I was told there's no way you're going to be an MP. This has already been stitched up for Tony Blair's political advisor. And there was all the fanfare around him and everything, and, and it was just sort of me and... Um, and so if I'd listened then, I wouldn't be an MP now. And in fact, that's the story of my life throughout everything I've done and, uh, and achieved. Nobody's ever said, oh Dawn, here you go, here it is on a plate, do you know what I mean? We're gonna rally around you and give it to you. It's always been the tough road. I, I don't, you know, it's not something I relish. You know, I would like to have an easy ride once, you know, once in a while, every now and again would be nice. But as a black woman, that's never the case anyway, um, you know, my mum's always said, as a black woman, you're going to have to work twice as hard just to be recognised. And just imagine, sometimes we're recognised, sometimes we're not recognised. We're both visible and invisible at the same time. Um, so I don't accept that uh, it's a runaway for Angela Rayner. There's lots of people that might accept that. But let me tell you something. I'm over the line and now it's one member, one vote. So there may be all the fanfare around a certain thing, but I would do what I always do. And that is just to roll my sleeves up, work really hard. And there's people that are coming on board. I've got an amazing team um, like of volunteers, people coming in, people wanting to help. 
People can smell and see an injustice and we should never underestimate the good people out there. And I'll never underestimate, you know, our membership and how amazing they are. So I'm not worried about it because I'm over the line. One member, one vote. You're not going to be in people's rooms when they're voting. And so, you know, this might be a surprise to some when I win, but me and my team, we've got our celebratory party ready. We're out, we're in this to win this. And I'm going to win because, and it's not just because, um, you know, it's not just because I'm black and I am a woman. I am really very well suited and qualified to do this job. I am the unity candidate. I'm the only person who's been a minister under a Labour government. Um, I can unify the party and it's not just about our policies. It's great that we've got amazing policies and our manifesto stays, but you need somebody who's going to be able to get us into government so that we can implement the policies. There's no point in just having policies that we're never going to implement because that doesn't change anything. We need to be in government. I've been in government and I know how to take us there again. I've got my core strategy, campaign, organise, recruit and educate. And I'm going to add a D to that, discipline, because that is vital if we're going to win at the next election. And I can do this. I know how to do it. You know, I ran the TUC Training Academy. I'm a trade union activist. I'm a computer programmer. I am the whole package. I can just do I, this. I agree with you. So, so, not necessarily that you're a candidate, to <laughs> make myself absolutely clear. But I agree with you that the Labour Party needs someone who can win to be in these senior positions. And... I'd like you to give me an example outside of politics of something that you've won. Oh, wow. Well, I've won lots of cases because uh, when I was a trade union official, um, I won, and in fact, I didn't lose a case. So, so every single tribunal case that I took to court, I won. Every single disciplinary case on behalf of my members, I won. Um, we can go as far back as school when I won my first poetry competition. I won that. Um, <laughs> you know, I do have a history of winning. I don't like losing. I, you know, it kind of upsets me. But I, what I do do is I say this, that I don't lose, I learn. So if I'm in a situation where I may have not won on that occasion, I will take that as a lesson and I'll interject that into the next thing I do to make sure that I win next time. So I'm not into this losing thing, I'm into a winning thing. Don Butler, thank you. Reach over there. <laughs>